Hello and welcome to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing, where nursing comes to life. In this podcast, you give us 15 minutes of your day and we'll take one complicated nursing topic and make it easy. Ready for nursing to be fun? I'm Morgan and today we're talking about heart failure. Specifically, we are going to tackle that left-sided heart failure. So let's get things started with our practice question. As always, I am not going to give you the right answer just yet. Hang on to what you think the answer is, and we will circle back to it at the end. So you, the nurse, are teaching a client about congestive heart failure. Which of the following information should the nurse include? And yes, select all that apply. So A, foods such as canned vegetables and lunch meat should be avoided. B, weigh yourself daily and notify the physician if weight gain is more than 10 pounds in a week. C, you may continue to take ibuprofen for your aches and pains. D, annual immunizations such as the influenza vaccine are recommended. And E, if you feel sick, you will need to check your urine for ketones. All right, so ready to jump in? Let's start with a quick little journey through the heart. I want to just dig into the A and P of how heart failure works. And you all know the heart is a two-sided pump. Its job is to keep blood moving in that perfect loop where the right side receives deoxygenated blood from the body and then pumps it into the lungs where it can get oxygen. The left side of the heart, today's main character, then gets that freshly oxygenated blood from the lungs and pumps it out to the rest of the body through the aorta. So now imagine that that left ventricle is exhausted, like burnout level, tired. It is stiff. It is weak. It cannot keep up with the demands of pushing blood forward out that aorta and into the arterial system. When the left side of the heart fails, it's like the out box at work is jammed. Nothing's getting out of there. The mail starts just backing up, backing up, backing up all the way into the inbox. And in this case, that's the lungs. We know blood is flowing from the lungs to the left side. When the left side can't move it forward, blood goes backward into the lungs. And that is why in left-sided heart failure, we see pulmonary symptoms. The blood can't move forward effectively, so it backs up in the lungs like a traffic jam. You know, it's a one-way road from lungs to left side of the heart out to the body left side of the heart, it's jammed up. It just can't push that blood forward. So it's backing up and that congestion is going into the lungs. That's leading to the dyspnea, the crackles, the orthopnea, that classic pink frothy sputum if things get really bad. You might even hear an S3 heart sound on auscultation. It's like an extra little gallop Think of it as the heart's sad little extra beat. It's trying to push out one more squeeze. And, you know, the only time I have auscultated a gallop, it was in a client with heart failure. It was during my med surge rotation in nursing school. A 72-year-old woman, she did have some past medical history here. Hypertension, coronary artery disease, two things that I know now are uh, major red flags or risk factors for that left-sided heart failure. But basically, she came in because of shortness of breath, okay? She hadn't been diagnosed with heart failure before, but for about the past week, she was having more and more trouble breathing. She thought, It's a cold, you know, I'm just getting over a bug. But what prompted her to finally, like, give up the ghost and just come in was that she couldn't sleep laying flat anymore. She had to be propped up on pillows to be able to feel like she could actually take a deep breath. What do we call that, everyone? That's orthopnea, right? Orthopnea, that need to sit up and able to breathe. And that is a hallmark sign of pulmonary congestion. We have got fluid backing up in the lungs. And that orthopnea can be caused for different reasons, but it does tell us that we've got congestion in that pulmonary circuit, okay? Too much fluid is there. So back to our client here. She has this orthopnea. She's getting triaged in the ED. O2 saturation is borderline low. It's at about 92. And you auscultate her lungs, you could hear wet crackles. That was the report that I got from the ED. Okay, we got 
low oxygen saturation, complaining of shortness of breath, crackles on auscultation. So she gets up to the floor. She's not in like critical condition needing to go to the unit. She comes to the med surge floor and me and my preceptor are doing her admission assessment. So we note all those things from the ED, like, yeah, she's satting in the low 90s, definitely has some crackles bilaterally. And then she starts coughing and she coughs up that classic, we all read it in our textbooks, pink tinged frothy sputum. So I was like, whoa, first time I've ever seen that. Definitely tells us we've got fluid backing up in the lungs. Then I listened to her heart. And it was the first time I distinctly heard that S3, that gallop. And that was when my brain started thinking heart failure. Everybody else was probably way more experienced and already knew that it was heart failure. But to me, that's what I was like, oh, that I remember in the textbooks, S3, extra heart sound. Heart is like really trying to beat heart to push that fluid forward. And S3 heart sound is a sign of fluid overload. Do you guys remember the only time an S3 is quote unquote normal? It's when you're pregnant, right? Because pregnancy is naturally a hypervolemic state. Our blood volume goes up by like a third because we're growing a whole nother human in there. So we need more fluid and the heart can make that S3 to push it forward. Most of the time, if we don't have someone pregnant, it's more so a sign of heart failure because that fluid is backing up. All right. So my preceptor's getting her hooked up to the monitor. She's like, go review her chart, like start putting some of the admission things in. I was working on, on my charting, on my documentation. So I see that she went to her PCP five days ago. That was when she was coughing and she like thought she just had a bug or something, right? I look at her weight and in the past five days, she has gained eight pounds. So huge clue here that we have a fluid retention problem. When you gain that much weight that quickly, it is not fat. It is not muscle. It is fluid. Her heart was not pumping effectively, so that fluid was backing up, right? First in the lungs, now kind of creeping into the rest of the system. I start going in to get her history, ask about diet, meds, etc. So we know her past medical history was that hypertension and that coronary artery disease, so she should be on a heart-healthy diet. But she does say, um, you know, I've been having a lot of chicken noodle soup, deli meat. It was easy. I don't have anyone that can help me cook at home. We ask about meds and she is taking her astorvastatin for the hyperlipidemia. She's not on anything for the coronary artery disease, but she also has arthritis and has been taking NSAIDs daily. And that is a change for her. She didn't used to have to take NSAIDs, ibuprofen every day, but the arthritis has really been flaring up. So to back it up into some pharmacology, something I didn't realize about NSAIDs, they can cause sodium and then fluid retention. So she was already prone to this heart failure due to her hyperlipidemia and coronary artery disease. She's eating a diet high in sodium, you know, soup, deli meat, etc. And then she started taking NSAIDs. They caused her to retain that sodium, then retain that fluid and the left ventricle could not keep up. There was already a higher afterload, that pressure the left ventricle had to push out due to the hyperlipidemia, the coronary artery disease. So that retention of fluid just put her over the edge. It was too much. The left ventricle could not keep up with pushing that fluid out. So everything really lined up. This was a super textbook case of congestive heart failure where she had the past medical history that put her at risk as it raised that afterload. She had the current signs and symptoms of all of that fluid backing up, the heart just being unable to pump forward and therefore backing up into the lungs, causing all of those classic dyspnea or thopnea, pink frothy sputum symptoms. So great, we've got our diagnosis. That all fell together pretty quickly, honestly, but the treatment did take a little bit. Name of the game is get fluid off and make the heart pump more effectively. 
So first, we're going to do some Lasix, IV for rosemide, so that we can actually diurese and get some of that extra fluid she's been retaining off. We did go ahead and put her on some just like two liter nasal cannula to get her oxygen saturations up. But really getting that fluid off was the first step. The next step was to get her heart pumping more effectively. So cardiology came in. They did their whole workup, asked her a bunch of the same questions. And after doing some labs and monitoring, decided to start her on digoxin. So remember, this is one of our medications that helps the heart squeeze a little bit harder. It does two things simultaneously. It is a positive inotrope. So it helps squeeze, contract, push that blood forward. Amazing. We definitely need that. It is also a negative chronotrope, which means it just slows the heart rate down a little bit. Remember when you're administering digoxin, one of those things is we check the pulse and we don't administer it if it's less than 60 because we don't want to slow the heart down any further. By slowing it down a little bit, though, that negative chronotropy, we are helping make the heart beat more effectively and improve that cardiac output. So hand in hand, IV for rosemide to get the fluid off and digoxin for that heart to squeeze harder. That was kind of the magic ticket to getting that blood moving forward so that it wasn't backing up in her lungs. And within several days, those symptoms were significantly improved. Now, all that being said, it's irresponsible to just send her out the door with some Lasix and digoxin and say, you know, see ya, good luck. There is a lot of education that goes into heart failure, okay? So what about her diet? She was eating, you know, canned goods, lots of preserved lunch meat, super high in sodium. We definitely had to do some teaching about a lower sodium diet. What is an appropriate heart healthy diet? We also needed to teach her about avoiding those NSAIDs since those cause the fluid retention. Not the best choice, especially when she's in this heart failure. Next, we taught her about checking her weight daily. As we mentioned, those quick weight gains are fluid, not fat. And if we're gaining weight quickly, we're retaining fluid, which in a client with heart failure means our heart failure is worsening. It means our cardiac output is not where we need it to be. That fluid is backing up. So daily weight checks, we want to educate things like at the same time of day, on the same scale, in the same clothes, so that we have a consistent reading and those other variables aren't influencing the weight. Another thing, we need our regular immunizations, that yearly flu shot, post-50, we need that pneumonia vaccination, all of those yearly vaccines that can really help prevent getting ill in the respiratory season, very important in a client with heart failure. And then lastly, she's going home on some new medications. So with Lasix, we need to take that in the morning. We don't want to be taking it right before bed or we'll be running to the bathroom. We want to teach about fall precautions. For digoxin, we already touched on checking the pulse, making sure we're holding it for a pulse less than 60. And remember, she was also on her astorvastatin for hyperlipidemia. So we want to make sure that she's taking that as well. Overall, we're kind of starting to get some polypharmacy, lots of different medications at play. So we definitely want the pharmacist to review everything, check for any contraindications, and just make sure we have good medication compliance. So all that being said, lots of education, lots of pharmacology involved, but remember the overlying goal. I don't want you to get bogged down in the details. All of our interventions, farm or non-farm, are about making that heart more effective to push blood forward. When blood's not moving forward, it's backing up. And in left-sided heart failure, it's backing up in the lungs, causing pulmonary symptoms. So I think you're ready to circle it on back to our practice question. And this time, I know you'll have the right answer and understand why. So remember, you are the nurse and you're teaching a client about congestive heart failure. Which of the following information should you include? Select all that apply. So we have A, foods like canned vegetables and lunch meat should be avoided. 
check, you know that is correct. Our client was eating, I think she said like canned chicken noodle soup or something. It set alarm bells off in my head. Eek, so much sodium. We're really going to be retaining that fluid and we don't want that in heart failure. B, weigh yourself daily and notify the physician if weight gain is more than 10 pounds in a week. Well, we absolutely do want them weighing themselves daily. More than 10 pounds in a week? Ooh, this is a little a little too much, a little too late, okay? Here's the parameters. Any weight gain of three to five pounds within a week is when we want to call our primary care provider, okay? If you wait until 10 pounds, that's fluid's going to be backed up in the lungs. You're going to have pulmonary edema, okay? So be incorrect. C was you may continue to take your ibuprofen for aches and pains. And I think you guys know uh, incorrect there. We are not going to recommend NSAIDs such as ibuprofen since they can contribute to fluid retention. Acetaminophen is a better choice for an over-the-counter pain medication in an individual that has heart failure. Now, D was annual immunizations, like our flu shot, are recommended. Absolutely. You know it sure is. We have increased risks of complications from flu, so we need that flu shot when there are comorbidities like congestive heart failure. And last, we had E. If you feel sick, you will need to check your urine for ketones. What do you think? Incorrect. Yeah, assessing those ketones is about hyperglycemia secondary to diabetes mellitus and does not have to do with congestive heart failure. All right, so now you guys have got it. It's a complex disease process, but just remember that heart is a pump, and if it's not pumping forward, blood is backing up into where it came from. In the left side, that's the lungs. L for left, L for lungs. We get all those pulmonary symptoms, and to treat, we've just got to get that fluid off and get that blood moving forward. All right, future nurses, that is a wrap. If you found this pod helpful, I'd love to continue supporting your nursing journey through nursing school, the NCLEX, continuing ed, and beyond. Archer Nursing has you covered with on-demand video lectures, high-yield question banks, live case study reviews, and so, so much more. We want to help you master tough concepts and make it fun. So join us over at archerreview.com. Follow us on socials at Archer Nursing for more free nursing tips and study resources. Thanks for tuning in to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing. I'm Dr. Morgan Taylor, and I'll see you back next time.